Hello guys, it's Paddy Kudair here, your local realtor in Ottawa. We are joined here with another episode of Canada on the Rocks, and we have with us the one and only Inspector Nate, Nate Boucher from Mike Holmes Inspections, especially for Ottawa. That's it. Thanks Nate, it's been me. a while for us to uh, kind of try to get this together. Yeah. I really appreciate, first of all, that you're taking the time, especially now. You guys have been, it's one of your busiest years ever. It, it has been, yeah, it has been. No, I, I'm, I'm super happy to be here. So thanks so much for having me on. Right after the pandemic, you know. <laughs> was, actually, you know what? It's a, good, it's a good segue. Let's get started with you telling me a little bit more about how your business was during the pandemic. Well, the pandemic was, I, I mean, everybody knows that it was a crazy time for real estate. And I'm, I'm sure if, if, you know, if you're an agent or anybody who was getting their license in that time, you know, it was a bit of a, a crazy time. For home inspectors, it was kind of the opposite. Um, because it was so crazy, if you put a condition in your offer, that went right in the trash. Like, it, it just, you had no chance. So um, yeah, we, a lot of inspectors, we were, we were a lot slower. We were having to find different ways to do it. So sometimes pre-listings was, was a big part. For me personally, I did a bunch of new construction. Mm -hmm. So warranty inspections for people getting in on new builds. And another thing is I, I did a number of inspections for people who had bought, couldn't get the inspection, still wanted to know. And so I'm coming in once they've taken possession and they're kind of like, okay, what did I get myself Hold into? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and fortunately, most of them were pretty good. I had a couple where it was like, this might be a little bit of a tough conversation because you're already locked in and you're moved in. And As well, was, buddy. So yeah, bad. So there, sad. You've already bought. Yeah. There, it was actually like a really, really uh, testing time, if you will. Like for us, I felt like a lot of the times you as the agent have to shine and have to rely on some of the experience as far as like what you can see, at least with your naked eye. Sure to, you know, go about kind of maybe 60, 70% of what could be as a problem. For example, foundation, smell, smell test, right. look into the attic and see if there's enough insulation. But you're not, at the end of the day, you're not an inspector, but you're doing some due diligence for your client yeah. to at least hopefully pass the puck a little bit. Absolutely. And I mean, like as agents, you know, you're, you see a lot of houses. Mm -hmm. So even though you're not like trained as a home inspector, you're still going to be at a better advantage than the, oh, yeah. the general public. For me, right? I had to rely a little bit more on, you know, the fact that I did some construction background oh, and all of that. Yeah. My dad is an architect. I've, I've done a lot of that stuff, yeah. but it wasn't at the end of the day, like I cannot vouch for it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think one thing that came up too, when I was talking to some agents is just when they were talking about like the liability, right? Mm -hmm. um, because they... You know, anyone who's who's been doing it for any period of time in the industry as a realtor generally cares about their clients and their client experience. Yeah. And an inspection is an important part of that. And they don't want you to waive it. They, they want you to get the house, of course, if, if that's what you want. And sometimes that was what was required to get that deal in place. But they'd much rather that you go through everything, that you understand the home, that you understand what maintenance is about, especially for first time home buyers. 100%. People moving, like a lot of people moved out of the city into a rural home. That might be the first time they're on well and septic. These systems are very different, right? So they kind of need a little bit more education. Exactly. And then the, the, the second that that sort of, you know, craziness went away, the first thing I implemented within my team is we're not doing a single purchase without an inspection. We're not doing even a single sale without a pre-inspection because we want to make sure to protect both parties. I don't want to be the one liable to it at the end yeah. of the day. With the I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm biased, but I think that's a great idea. <laughs> it is, it is. Because at the end of the day, for me, it's like, look, man, you're just about to spend the biggest purchase of your life. Yes. And it's your home. Yes. That's the it. last thing you want to do is like laying down in the middle of the night and then, you know, something is leaking or, you know, your roof is, is caving in or, you know, it's too cold for you at night because yeah. of the insulation, what have you, or the foundation got a crack or something. So let's go back a little bit to the whole Mike Holmes, you know, sure. first off, Mike Holmes is actually one of my greatest inspiration why i got into real estate oh, watching cool. all those shows back in the day yeah same with me right? uh, but with that being said i wanted to understand kind of your affiliation with with mike holmes foundation and what is it all about and like just tell me a little bit more and let the audience know kind of what to expect why mike holmes yeah absolutely so mike holmes obviously has been around for over 20 years. It's a household name. That's it. Yeah. Internationally known. You, um, you kind of do have a little bit of resemblance to it. Yeah. Do I? Yeah. I don't know. He's, ironically, he's got a little more hair than me, <laughs> even despite the age difference. But uh, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so obviously he's, he's very well known. He's been like the go-to contractor for you know, a long time. Yeah. And his philosophy of make it right is really what, what um, drives that trust, right? The goal is to like really get to the, the heart of things and do it right the first time. And 
So when we started Mike Holmes Inspections, they had been running it in the Toronto area for about 15, almost 20 years probably, um, before we started to franchise it across Canada. Mm -hmm. So it was in Toronto and it was largely geared around supporting the, the Homes Approved Homes program, which is certain builders come on board and they basically partner with us. And it's um, like an added level of uh, quality checks to ensure yeah. that they're delivering for their clients. And so we started it as that. So there'll be inspections as part of that due diligence process so that when you're turning over a home, it's ideally in the best possible shape that it could be for those clients, which is I feel great. like it's kind of defeating the purpose of the show, right? Like if you're doing it before, Mike is not going to be on the show later on. Well, that, for, for that so this, was, house, th yeah. this was for new construction. Those were for builders, right? Yeah. And so then they decided, well, we might as well Let's open this up to everybody, right? Mm -hmm. And so we started to expand it. Within Toronto, they ran it for a while. And now recently, in the last couple of years, so just at the tail end of COVID really, is when we started to expand franchising across Canada. I was one of the first franchisees to come on board. I've been running the Ottawa area since uh, 2021. Oh. And yeah, yeah. and I, in that time, I, I've been able to kind of help a lot of the other franchisees as they come on board and get them set up uh, across Canada and, and support them as well. For me, it was a great opportunity because... Um, the branding is great, but also the support structure. Um, it was, you know, what right now in Ontario, home inspections is not a licensed profession. So anybody can really just slap a sticker on the side of their truck, call themselves a home inspector, and there's not like a governing body that's going to clamp down on that. Unlike, you know, if you're a doctor or even a realtor, like you can't, uh, if you're a realtor, you can't do that, right? Like you have to be licensed. So um, it's one of those things that uh, because there isn't that quality control, we're trying to establish things like that. There are some organizations, but we put our guys through different training as well that's over and above industry standards. And that's what really appealed to me on top of just the name, right? It's it's that we are coming in, we're doing it right the first time and, and doing our best to-, to That's amazing, because that was actually gonna be my next question is okay. like, what sort of differentiates you from the next inspector coming in? And you rightfully kind of answered that right on the nose, really appreciate it. Yeah. With that being said, how long have you been in the business? Uh, so I've been inspecting for probably about five years or so, um, about two years with the, the Homes Group. Prior to that, I used to do inspections with an engineering firm and I traveled a lot. It was a great experience. They specialized in remote areas and a lot of that work that they would get would be for First Nations communities. Mm -hmm. So I, I spent a lot of time in the Yukon, which was very different um, and a lot of you know community housing for First Nations communities in the Yukon. Uh, so I was back and forth a lot and it was a, an amazing experience. I got to meet a lot of great people. I got to, I learned very quickly and had a great support system there as well. And then the opportunity for franchising came up and that was going to give me a little bit more time locally with my family. I have two young girls, so I wanted to spend amazing, more time yeah. with the family. So that that's kind of how I pivoted into that. Just on the, uh, the Mike Holmes inspections uh, sort of things, what does it take to become a Mike Holmes inspection and what sort of rigorous uh, procedures or training or what have you that requires by the Mike Holmes Foundation to, you know, just say that, hey, I'm Mike Holmes inspection approved, if you will. Right. So, so there is like some specific schooling that's required. So once you complete that schooling, we also put everyone through our methodology training so that they understand the process that we're trying to do. Because it's more than just the knowledge. It's the, the biggest thing for us is really about providing that great client experience. There's a lot of great inspectors out there who really know their stuff, but maybe they just don't have that personal connection or, or they, they, they have to figure out the communication part. Yeah. And that's, that's a, a big thing, especially when you see people coming from trades or construction, they, they know their stuff, uh, but they might not have interacted with the public as much, depending on the type of job. They just, it's not that they can't, they just don't have that experience. And so that's what we're trying to look at, trying to find people who can marry those two, the knowledge and the communication part. Because if you can't break down complex ideas and explain it to somebody who's buying a home for the first time, there, there's going to be this gap. And yeah. so that's really what it's, what we try and to do. And that's actually on. like, it's one of those deal breakers a lot of the times uh, is the home inspection. Like, you know, the finance might pass through, everything is fine, you know, the, the banking, all of that stuff is cool. But sure. then when it comes to the home inspector, I don't want to say like you, at the end of the day, like obviously you don't want to be forcing anybody making the wrong decision. But yeah. in the same token, when you have an inspector that's a little bit more pessimist, if you will, yeah, it kind of puts a little sour taste in the in the buyer's mouth and then they're just kind of on the guard. They're kind yeah. of backing up a little bit. I 100% agree. So my approach personally, and this is kind of what we look at for Mike Holmes as well, we want to educate people as best as possible. We're not going to sugarcoat things. We're not going to slide things under the rug and not tell you how it is. 
but we're not gonna like blow something out of proportion. I'm gonna try yeah. and put it in context so that you understand. Here's a foundation crack. Is this a structural concern or is this like more of a cosmetic thing? Or is it possibly just basement leakage? All those things might mean different things to different people. And everybody has different tolerances for what they want to, yeah. to repair. But, you know, if I start going, oh, well, this and all that, and it, I've already directed the conversation. And that's not fair because mm -hmm. I don't know the, the clients, generally it's buyers. So I don't know their buying journey. And that's why I like to pass them back to you guys because you, you know their budgets, you know their family situation. You know, are they upsell, uh, upsizing, downsizing? Are they, you know, growing their family? Are they going through a divorce? These are all things that are very important 100%. in your home buying. And I don't know that stuff. I, I just met them. So I, I try not to overstep in that regard. And totally. I give them... And it's not like I don't, I don't think it's overstepping. I think it's just like uh, the way that you people position it or inspectors position it. It just kind of sometimes, like I said, it makes or breaks the deal. Yeah, absolutely. So what we do a little bit different, and I'm, I'm not sure if, you know, your agents that you work with do that or not. But a lot of the times we'll actually have a conversation. It's like, I call it the pre-inspection conversation with okay. the client. So what it is, look, we've talked about this before. Here's what's going to happen. You're going through this inspection and here's what the inspection is supposed to be. To me, the inspection is more of a report card, right? Sure. That report card is going to tell you where you have some sort of deficiencies, if you will. There's no such thing as a home with 100%. Everything is going to check out. Yeah. If, if you can do that. It's either a brand new build and it's been inspected a couple of times because even brand new build have issues. Absolutely. Or you just a lucky SOB. Yeah. <laughs> but with that being said, you just prepare them and say, look, this is what's going to happen. Here's what's going to come up. And it's all up to your tolerance. It's all up to what you're comfortable with. For yes. example, if we're looking at, you know, a few cosmetics here and there, five to a thousand dollars, 500 bucks to a thousand dollars, who cares? We'll just pass on. If it's going to be something major where it's foundation crack or something like that, then we can maybe look into possibly getting a little bit of a refund or ne renegotiate the deal. But it's not used, like, and, and I always emphasize this, we're not using this as a renegotiation tactic ever because that's just bad business for both myself and for the seller agent. And it's also bad business for, for the seller that's already put their hopes up and what have you. Yeah. But what we're going to use this is in the event that you don't think your tolerance is there, we're either going to walk away or we're going to try to negotiate and try to fix this. The other thing too that I always tell them, and I'm, I'm not really sure what, you know, what school you come from as far as thought, uh, I always say like, we're never going to rely on the seller to fix this. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. Um, it, it, it definitely depends because the seller's going to be, ha they're just going to have different motivations and yeah. they're going to fix it to check that off their list and move on because they're, they've got lots of other things yeah. that they're doing but, too. But just like I said earlier, it might be just like a sweeping it under the rug kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. We fixed it, but all we did was just put a patch on it and you don't right. really know what's behind it. And I've seen that before where people, oh, something happened and they fixed it and then the buyers came in they're like, well, that's not really how I would have mm -hmm. done it. And you don't really have like a, you can't legally go after anyone because they, they fixed it for you. But if you were going to do it differently than... Yeah, maybe you can take that responsibility on and, and figure that out with the negotiation. And even then, sometimes like when we say, OK, well, you fix it as a seller, but we're going to put it up to the buyer's satisfaction. That's a very loose term. Yeah. Buyer satisfaction means, you know what? Nah, I, I don't like the way it looks. I'm just going to leave. And it just kind of leaves a little bit of a doubt. And that's why I always have that pre-inspection conversation to make sure that they're prepared. That's a great and idea. I actually have it on both sides. I have it with you and I have it with them. Hey, by the way, here's a situation. They're a first time home buyer or they're, you know, very, very experienced buyer. Or here's like, we just kind of prepare both sides. So you're not walking in going, oh, these guys know everything. I did. Like, for example, I had one inspector that he came in and the guys are actually in construction. They've been in construction for probably 25 years. Perfect. The first thing I said to him, I said, listen, these guys are in construction. You need to be very careful what you say in front of them because at the end of the day, they know everything. And that was a for lack of a better term, shit show. Yeah. <laughs> because he just basically put his foot in his mouth, said a few things, and it, they're like, well, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. And that's the thing. Like, sometimes just it's all about a conversation and just having that conversation before, because we're a team at the end of the day. Yeah. And our job, your job and mine, is to make sure that we protect the one person that hires us, which is the buyer. Yeah, absolutely. Or the seller. I, I think that's a great example. Um, where I try to look at it, when I'm, I'll usually ask if, if it hasn't been told to me like that already, which would be great. 
But sometimes I'll ask, especially if sometimes people bring, you know, the buyer's dad is the common one, right? Ooh, well, sometimes- My favorite. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and sometimes the buyer's dad might be a little, you know, over enthusiastic and doesn't really, they don't have the expertise. But I've been on times when the buyer's dad is engineer or, um, you know, an electrician or, or, or some type of specialist. And, and that's great. I, I love to have other, I don't, I don't need anybody, you know, some people, oh, they're inspecting the inspector. No, let's work together. We're on the same team. Yeah. And so we'll break, I'll be like, oh, hey, yeah, I'm going to rely on you to help me out with that part. Because at the end of the day, as a home inspector, I am not a specialist in every area. I'm a generalist. I, I liken it to being like a family doctor. Yep. You go to your family doctor, they'll look at some stuff. They may be like, hey, you might have an ear infection or maybe you have, you know, certain things. Or maybe you have like a appendicitis and they will refer you to a specialist. They won't just pop you up on the table and cut you open and start doing no. surgery right there. No. And nor would you want them to. And so that's the same thing with me. Like I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a specific trades person in a lot of trades. I have my own background, but I don't know everything about everything and nobody can. Yeah. So I know a little bit about a lot of things. And basically the, the, the goal for me is to, when I don't know something, to refer for further evaluation on something that might be a, a, bar, a bigger problem for someone. Yeah, and then that goes to show like, you know, at the end of the day, your integrity of doing your job, right? Like, if, look, I'm a generalist, just you mentioned, I'm not gonna be the expert on everything foundation. I'm not gonna be the expert on everything electrician. You need someone that's gonna take a look at this because this looks sort of, you know, from the kind of schematic, the way it looks here, it looks like you might need someone to check it out again. Right. Yeah. And Just I've got a see. handful of, of uh, great like tradespeople that I, I know, I trust, and we have a great relationship. And whether it's giving them a referral and they come in and assess and do the work, or sometimes I just send them a quick picture. Like sometimes realtors will send me a quick picture and ask, hey, what about this? And I'll give them a quick answer. They'll, you know, I've got a, a great electrician, especially yeah. who I'll send them a quick picture and he'll send me back and be like, yep, yeah, that's okay because of this, this, and this. Or we're going to want to look at that, right? So Very interesting. It's, it's again, home inspections to me is like one of the most important steps in the buying process. And when we had the whole craziness with the pandemic, I've always sort of relied on at least maybe bringing a tradesperson or someone, you know, more of a general contractor or somewhat, at least to the showing. Right. To protect my buyer somehow. Sure. Yeah, uh, it's better. It's definitely better than that. And we've done it before. We're, you know what? We're going to do a quick little... You know, half an hour showing, we'll bring an inspector with us and we'll pay him for that half an hour or whatever, that, just so they can inspect the major things that are going to be issued. Yeah. And, and so like with our professional organizations, they prefer, and our insurance companies, they prefer if we don't do those types of mm -hmm. inspections. But in that time frame, I get it. Like it was, it, it, if you weren't getting at least some eyes on some of the major things, those are the biggest surprises, yeah. right? Structure, HVAC, electrical, plumbing, like these are the things, roofing. That if you have to replace stuff, you know, if you don't know it, it, it it's a big surprise and you, nobody likes that. So speaking of surprises, what are some of the craziest surprises you've seen as far as foundation is concerned? Foundation, I would say, especially in Ottawa, we have a lot of century homes, a lot of older homes and a lot of, a lot of old homes that have been retrofitted or, or renovated uh, in various ways, sometimes very well done and great. Other times... Not so much. And maybe it was slapped together by either, you know, just a, a homeowner Double who didn't gun. really know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Something like that. Some, deep. <laughs> yeah. Some of the old stone foundations. I, I've seen some where there's a hole like in the foundation, like you can put your arm through it oh, in, wow. right into the basement. And obviously it's not a livable basement. This is more like a cellar, but still, once you have that, you know, you can have motion there. So that's not a great solution. I've been in a couple places where, you know, there's some dangerous electrical, like just wires kind of hanging in the basement and they're live, you know, Craziness. stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the other side of it would probably be just the, um, the, the, the face palm DIY moments that you see. Sometimes you come on stuff and it's just like, who, who thought this was a good idea? Right. So let's yeah. just patch it up. Yeah, yeah. Right. Some of the foundation, like a lot of the times when you look at the foundation, there's different kind of cracks, foundation cracks, different kind of, uh, damages, if you will. What are some of the major ones and some of the minor ones that you experience so one of the, and this is general but one of the best ways to determine is first off is it vertical or horizontal if it's a horizontal crack that's where you have the potential for some shifting right and so that could be a structural concern especially in like those older homes that i was talking about where it's stone and there is that there could be motion a vertical crack 
isn't always a structural concern. It could be from settling, sure, but often your, your bigger concern with a vertical is going to be uh, basement leakage, which is still a problem. You don't want your basement to leak. It can, yep. it can destroy things, um, but it's a different type of fix and it's generally a little easier. You're not worried about the house shifting the same way. And vertical cracking is very common. We come across that very often. Most houses have maybe hairline cracking. Sometimes it's just in the parging, which is just decorative for the most part on the outside. Mm -hmm. And that's not a big deal. You can seal that up. But if it's cracked right through, then you might want to look at having that repaired either by a professional or getting a repair kit. They're not varies, a major concern, think, like, perhaps, but... From some of the you know nightmares we've seen as far as yeah. inspections and uh, cracks and all of that, it varies, I find, from you know 12 bucks for like a little patch. You go buy that at Home Depot and call yeah. it a day or up to $30,000 of full foundation repair? It depends on what you're doing. So the more expensive ones generally is gonna involve some type of excavation on the outside. Yeah. Maybe an older home that doesn't have a foundation wrap like we do now. Newer homes have a foundation wrap, which makes for a much better seal against water leakage. Is it 100%? Of course not, nothing's 100%, mm -hmm. but it's way better than having nothing. Foundations are going to crack, you know, concrete will crack. Sometimes it's just part of the curing process. Sometimes it's from shifting or settlement. It's just how big, if it goes right through. I had a town home, one of my, my very first home. It, it cracked in two places. They weren't major structural problems, but they leaked really badly in the spring one time. And I was planning on finishing my basement. I had to pump the brakes on that. And fortunately, I discovered this before I started yep. things. And I was able to patch it up and they were, you know, it was, it was a, a decent repair for both of those. And we left it for like a while to, to make sure that it was good. And then we finished the basement in a year and a half later or so. Uh, but we went through a full freeze-thaw cycle with the spring to make sure that we were in good shape. And that's the biggest thing too, especially like if you're buying in the winter or buying sort of late in the season, if you will, before the winter starts, like late fall. Yeah. You're not really seeing a lot of those issues because obviously the frost line starts to kind of set in so spring is a different game yeah in canada especially in ottawa we have all four seasons and we get yep. them we get them hard like we get pretty warm very well defined and pretty cold it's actually one of the things i love about the city is just the fact that all those seasons are very well defined right like yeah cold winter harsh really nice summer you got a weird spring and kind of a good looking it's, it's a know, nice fall, fall. Yeah. yeah yeah and the leaves are great here too yep. yeah yeah it's and that's great but that kind of differential in temperature and, and seasons does affect your foundation and your home in general. So we have to do things that, or take you know maintenance precautions differently than perhaps somebody who lives in a more temperate climate that doesn't have that kind of fluctuation, or maybe a southern climate that doesn't have harsh winters or something yeah. like that. Yeah, I'd like to think of it as like a bipolar weather. Yeah. yeah. Very bipolar. With that being said, how does that affect your business? Well, I mean, it affects my business in the sense that, you know, the, the real estate market is seasonal. Mm -hmm. uh, it affects my business very similar to how it affects your business, yeah. probably. Yeah. So, you know, in the wintertime, everyone kind of slows down and goes on vacation. And, you, you, you get know, to enjoy some <laughs> vacation between Christmas and New <laughs> Year's me. Eve. And yeah. That's, maybe a little bit into January. Absolutely. I'm a little slower right now, but that for me, I'm fine with that because I get to spend time with my family and my, my young girls. And yeah, and then spring hits and it's go, go, go and, and until the next winter. And what does that look like for you guys? Because I mean, most of what you do is in and out of the house, right? How do you, how do you cope with that for the what, summer and the, and the winter? Uh, in, in what sense? Well, in the sense like you're outside checking the roofs and doing oh, all that okay. stuff. Like it's, it's a little freezing cold out there. Yeah. In the winter, I mean, we're, we're going to have some, we have some restrictions in the winter when, it, when it's fully snow covered. Right now there's a little bit of snow but it's just cold. I can still get to the roof. I can still see the roof. So yeah, in the transitionary periods, especially it's, it's a little chilly, but mm -hmm. it is what it is. I find the clients are less eager to follow me around <laughs> outside when it's winter, which I don't mind an audience, but most people are like, yeah, you want to follow me? And they're like, yeah, we'll just wait for the wrap up. Yeah. And yeah. that's totally fair. If it's 40 below, I wouldn't want to do it either. But yeah, it definitely is a little different. And then we have some limitations. Once the, the roof is fully covered in snow, I can only see what I can see. And so we're kind of going off then, you know, the age of the roof based on what's been provided. Any areas we can see, sloping and whatnot, for like structurally, yes, we can still see that. But for the actual roofing, like covering itself, the shingles for the most part, our best bet then is to look from inside the attic and see if we have any past signs of leakage or moisture. Mm -hmm. um, and then making sure ventilation is good and all that stuff. But yeah, we definitely have some limitations. Same with the, 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 the grading around the home. Like 
if it's covered in snow, I can't see what I could normally see. So. so it sounds like we've touched a little bit on the foundation, the roofing. What other major points or major areas in the house that you would want to check and make sure that the audience know that this is something very important? Uh, three things, HVAC, plumbing, electrical. So your mechanical systems. Plumbing and electrical have changed drastically over the years. So when you have, say, between a 100-year-old home to a home that's been built today, the way we build things, the materials that we use, it's changed a lot. And those two things especially factor into uh, insurance. So with electrical, you know, going way back, you have knob and tube wiring or ungrounded systems. You also have the potential for aluminum wiring that was more like 60s, 70s. That type of stuff uh, can cause complications with getting insurance. There's ways around things, of course. Yeah, you, you want to look at if things are updated properly. If it's an older home, a lot of times they have done an update, but we want to double check to make sure it's done correctly. It's been signed off by the ESA, stuff like that. For plumbing, very similar. We've kind of gone through things, you know, building materials is the big the big thing, the way so, we've changed. I don't mean to cut you off there, no but problem. both you and I know what ESA is, but could you please explain it to yeah, some of our absolutely. audience? The ESA is the Electrical Safety Authority. And so in Ontario, they are that governing body that signs off on electrical to make sure that it's safe. Often your insurance, say a good example is aluminum wiring. If you have aluminum wiring, the um, insurance company will generally ask you for an ESA certificate, meaning that it's either been swapped to copper, which is expensive, or commonly pigtailed and yeah. then has to be signed off by that electrician saying this has been pigtailed professionally, it's not a DIY job, and it's safe, then your insurance company will be okay with that. And then you've touched on the HVAC and so plumbing, we already talked about that in HVAC, a little bit more about that. If you don't yeah, H HVAC is just one of those things that as, especially as we get, you know, more and more into high efficiency furnaces and heat pumps, et cetera, they're just, they're mechanical systems that require maintenance and they, they eventually fail and you have to replace them. And, and they're not the cheapest. They're also very important. You can get away with an, without an air conditioner. It's not fun, but you can do it. Mm -hmm. You can't get away without heating in your home in Ottawa. Your, your pipes will freeze, you'll have problems. Like you, you just can't do yeah. it. So you either need to have either an alternative source of heat like wood, which is common now, especially in rural markets, or you want to have a properly sized furnace, especially if you're in the city. So that is something that, or, or heat pump now, heat pumps are becoming much more popular. Uh, but that's something that you want to be able to budget. We're going to test those systems and we're going to look for any signs of, early signs of failure and also looking at just lifespans. Maybe there's a furnace there, it's running great, but it's 30 years old. I don't necessarily think you should go out and replace it right yeah. away, but you got to budget for that in your mind that this doesn't owe us anything, right? Like it could go tomorrow. It could last another five That's years. Crazy. My last sale, actually, I'm glad you brought it up. My last sale had a furnace that was 52 years old and wow. it's still humming like a baby. And they, we, we just sold it. Yeah. 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 So, and that day, becomes, like, comes, it plays into your tolerance, right? Exactly. So what's your will. And if it's that old, now efficiency is going to be a question too, because they wouldn't have had high efficiency furnaces 50 years no. ago. So you're a fit, if you upgrade, you'll get a much more efficient furnace. Is, are the new furnaces going to last 50 years? No. No, they, they just won't. They have more things going on with them, more, more moving pieces, and uh, it, it, but the efficiency rate will be significantly higher. So there might be a, a balance in there at some point. So is it fair to say that so far that the most important parts of the home, from what we've discussed, is the foundation, the roof, the plumbing, the heating, or HVAC, and electrician, or electrical? Yep. Those five things are your major. Those focus. are your five major. Outside of that, then you basically have like your interior, your exterior. Your interior tends to be more of a personal preference because sometimes people come in and they're like, everything is fine, but I want to change it all. And that's fine. Like, you know, if you don't like the kitchen, you don't like the kitchen. Uh, you can redo it. But does it work? Yeah, it should work. If, or, you know, if the cabinets are falling off and doors are falling all over the place, that's different. If the floor is all ripped up, that's different. Or the hot water. But, yeah. And the cold water switch. That's sure. A, that's a very common one. I've yeah, seen. that happens a lot. Yeah. So that kind of stuff, you know, those are smaller things perhaps, um, depending on the house. Um, but they, they're more of a personal thing. Like you, you can live with certain things unless they're really egregious. Whereas a broken furnace, you can't live with that at least through the winter. You need to fix it. Mm -hmm. um, a foundation that is actively leaking you need to fix that stuff. Dangerous electrical, shouldn't live with that for a while. It could be a fire hazard, definitely a shock hazard, yeah. that kind of stuff, right? So 
that's kind of what we're looking at that stuff that's immediate so that when you move in, you don't have these big surprises like, oh, this roof is really old and leaking. Why didn't I know about that? Right? Like, ideally, it's disclosed. And definitely, if we got an inspection, we should be able to find that stuff. But you don't want that yeah. as a surprise. And I find, especially with older homes, like a lot of the times with the, uh, with the electrical uh, and sometimes structural too, like it just, you'll see signs of damage. It's very, sure. I don't want to say it's very easy, but it's, if you look carefully, you will see signs of damage. You will see, for example, this wire may be caught on fire one day. Uh, you know, the roof is caving in a little bit. This beam is not where it's supposed to be. The load is a little bit different. It's not supposed to be here. It's supposed to be here. So all of that stuff, sometimes it's easy to spot, but a lot of the times we rely on expertise for a reason. Yeah, for sure. Speaking of the expertise over here, tell me about some of the schooling and some of the, the training that you guys have to go through to be able to become an inspector. And not necessarily the microphones. We've already talked about that. Yeah, that's fine. So, general. Yeah, and so like I said, it's it's not licensed. So they're, they're, the requirements aren't there, but for a lot of professional organizations, and if you really want to be legitimate, there are some schools. There's a couple, a couple of the biggest ones. Carson Dunlop is one of the biggest ones. Uh, in Canada, and they provide a lot of content. It's what a lot of inspectors have gone through. There is another one uh, that's uh, that we're actually working on right now. It's a Mike Holmes thing, so that's going to be a pretty big one too. Nice. And so, those are are some great options um, that give you a really good foundation. Now, obviously, that's in school, and that's sort of your your classroom learning. It gives you a good foundation of knowledge, but you have to get out in the field there and learn as well. It's great to be able to partner up with either another inspector or somebody and get some type of experience in field so you kind of see it in the real world. Real hands-on, yeah. Because yeah. at the end of the day, like it's one thing to see it in books and learn it and stuff. And it's just, it's yeah. not the same when you're going out there and you're actually doing the work. I'll, I'll give you a very, very perfect example. For me, going through real estate, yeah, learning all the paperwork, learning all the different definitions and this and that, and like how you go about investment properties. It's not the same until you start doing your first investment property or your first yeah. uh, sort of purchase. And you'll feel like, holy crap, like all of what I've learned is done in like one second, in one yeah. transaction. It's yeah, crazy. And, and you'll get regional differences too, right? When you learn it from the book, it kind of just gives you everything. And some things you'll never see or see very infrequently in our market. Another thing, like roofing is a great example. Here we see... 95% asphalt shingles, especially mm -hmm. in the city. And then metal roofing is probably the, the, the number two. Other than that, we don't see a lot of other, like we don't really see clay tiles or slate or, you know, fiber cement shingles. That kind of stuff is, just, we don't see it. You go to a different area, you go out into the desert, like in Arizona, you will not see very many asphalt clay. shingles. Yeah, you'll see either clay or fiber cement because it's so hot. The asphalt shingles basically just like melt and fall apart. Yeah. If they see asphalt shingles, people are usually like, that's a really cheap builder, right? Or, yep. or somebody replaced it with super cheap stuff exactly. because it just doesn't last there. Here, totally common. We don't have that kind of heat, so it's it's not as big of a deal. Just taking a look at some of the, you know, sort of the inspections you've done over the years. Do you have one that's kind of stands out and what's the story behind it? Yeah, I guess there's a couple. Uh, I mean, there, for me, it's usually comes down to the person. So one of the ones that I did coming out of COVID where they were kind of in that, or did I get myself into, they were, they, they were relatively well off. Like they weren't, you know, they weren't in dire needs, but they had budgeted to put about maybe 40 to 50 K into this house because they knew it needed some work. And but then once we did our inspection, it was probably going to be closer to double that. Wow. And so they were going to be okay. But they weren't super thrilled about it. No. And so and so we had some conversations about some stuff and helped kind of prioritize things. And they were very like already looking at like, okay, we're going to bring this guy in to do this stuff and this guy to do this stuff. But those are the ones where I kind of felt like you feel bad because I, I don't like delivering bad news, but it's part of the job sometimes. And so there was definitely some some issues where things were just kind of concealed or just not done properly. They, they had a boiler system for their heating, which is not super common in this area. And it was with like the baseboards and one of them had clearly leaked and the whole wood floor was all kind of warping. And now you're worried about possible rot, possible mold, things like that. Yeah. There was another area where the living space over the garage, the garage wasn't sealed properly. The garage should be airtight or gas tight so that you can't have fumes coming up, carbon monoxide from your cars. That's a potential- Especially you know, if you live in it. Yeah, that's a potential dangerous thing. Now. 
The floor above, is are the fumes gonna get through? Maybe not, but what had happened is all the flooring, because it wasn't sealed properly, was all warped from heat or moisture, probably both. So, and these are things they just didn't really notice on the quick walkthrough, but now when we're going through a little finer, we're noticing like all your flooring in here is a little weird. It's cosmetic, but again, you might have mold, you might have rot, you don't know what's underneath that. And so there's certain things where they were starting to stack that up and be like, hmm, I might have to do a lot more work here than I was hoping for. Yeah. And they were, they were happy with me, but they weren't super thrilled with what we were discovering because they would have been able to budget differently or maybe negotiate differently during that time frame. And unfortunately, that wasn't the case. What are some of the things that you'd want to kind of let the audience know or advice, if you will, to just let them know about home inspections and what they should do and all of that stuff? Leave them with. I think for me, so picking the right inspector is very important. Somebody who you can communicate with well, who obviously knows their stuff and needs to be certified and whatnot, but, um, but somebody who can communicate well and, and really they're open to questions. So if you have questions, they can help explain things. For me, that's the biggest thing. I always come back to that communication piece. And because we, a good inspector will inspect the home, but a great inspector will help you understand the home. And I think that's the biggest part, especially yeah. if you're a first time home buyer or if you're changing situations like, you know, city to rural or rural to city or, you know, moving from a different country. Like I, I know a lot of people um, who work with a lot of um, people who are, who are moving from a different part of the world. We build homes very differently than they do. Massive difference. Yeah, yeah. like I've, I've worked with a number of people. You know, I, I worked with one agent who had this family. They're moving from India and they aren't used to winters like this, right? Like they're like, what's a furnace? Like, I don't know how this system works. And the roofing is totally different. And so being able to go through that and explain that, they were, they yeah. were very happy with that. It's kind of one stuff. thing to kind of stay like, this is a problem. It's another to say, well, it's a problem, but you can do this to fix it. Or, you know, it's a problem, but you actually don't really need to fix it now until maybe like... Being able to prioritize. To, exactly, right? prioritize. And I find the biggest thing with any inspector that I've worked with, and hopefully we can work together more and more, yeah. uh, is the ability to just be candid and straight up and sort of like put it in matter of fact, if you will. Matter of fact, this is broken. This is why. This is how you fix it. Simple as that. With that being said, I really appreciate you coming here on the show. Really appreciate kind of sharing your wisdom with the audience. And one thing that I want to invite the audience to is actually go on your IG. Oh, Inspector yeah. Nate. For sure. Thank he's you. always out there giving us the little glimpse. You know, sometimes he's like on the roof doing all of that stuff. <laughs> Love it. It's, it's actually, it's one of those favorite things that I do every day is like a check Nate and see what he's Thank doing, you. what he's yeah. up to. And very helpful tips, believe it or not. Even if you're getting into the real estate or, you know, investors or even first time home buyers, it's uh, worth following for sure. Thank you. I appreciate really appreciate that. it. And I'll make sure that we, we tag him as well too. So you guys can get to, uh, to see that and then follow him. Uh, guys, I really appreciate it again. Nate, thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah. Thanks for having and me. If you guys love the, uh, the show and love what it's all about here in Ottawa and then, you know, the, all the great businesses that we have here, I'd love for you to hit that like and subscribe. And Nate is obviously very good looking here. So definitely yeah. hit that like, <laughs> and, uh, for more, for more of these episodes, just make sure to hit the subscribe and we'll see you soon. Thanks again. Thanks again.